Good afternoon and welcome to People, Politics and Prose with Ronald Granieri. Granieri. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. Um, this afternoon, Ron is going to be talking to Ian Morris about his new book, uh, Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, a 10,000 year history. It, uh, it portends to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, Dr. Granieri is the FPRI Templeton Fellow. Uh, he's the Templeton Education Fellow this year. And he's also the Executive Director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West. And he is also an Associate Professor of History in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the US Army War College. And for that reason, we have to do the mandatory uh, disclaimer that anything he says here today uh, does not reflect the views of the US government, the US Army or the Army War College. They're his own personal opinions. Uh, I'd also encourage you today to put any questions you might have down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and start putting those in whenever you think of them because uh, Ron often uh, will um, uh, use some of those questions in the actual formal part of, of the discussion this morning. But we will about halfway through go to Q&A as well. Um, finally, I'd like to say thank you, a hearty thank you to our supporters, our board members and sponsors, anyone who, who is listening today, those who are not. Uh, we cannot do this important work without you and we are truly grateful. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ron Granieri. Thank you, Raleigh. Thank you, President Flynn. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And welcome to this latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you joining us live on Zoom or on the, uh, on the, FPRI, uh, on the FPRI YouTube channel recorded. Um, as lo our loyal members and partners know, FPRI pursues a geopolitical approach to the study of world affairs that considers current questions through the lenses of history, geography, and culture. An appreciation of the complex interrelationship between the unchanging realities of space, the powerful but shifting influence of the past, and the role of contemporary culture in shaping our understandings of both of them helps us to avoid simple judgments and to think deeper about how we got where we are and what we think about it and what we can do about it. Such an approach, we believe, can both help us avoid being surprised by developments, but also help us to avoid complacency. It also generally tries to avoid the assumption that any present situation was inevitable, which is certainly something to keep in mind. At the same time, though, any thoughtful observer would have to admit that it was probably inevitable that we would have our current guest on the program to discuss his new book. In Geography is Destiny, Britain's Place in the World, a 10,000 year history, Ian Morris offers his readers a lively tour through a hundred centuries of British history, helping readers understand how men and women of the British Isles have accepted, modified, and debated their literal and figurative place in the world. From the earliest human settlements to the contemporary challenges of globalization, he writes, five issues have remained constant, identity, mobility, prosperity, security, and sovereignty. With these ideas in mind and three special maps as his guide, Morris encourages us to see how geography is both a concrete reality and a continuously created social construction as societies come to grips with the meanings of the mountains and rivers and oceans that mark their horizons. So where is Britain? Where do Britons think it is? How has that changed over time? And what can we learn from their debates these are some of the questions we will address today in our conversation with Dr. Ian Morris. Ian Morris is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and Professor in History at Stanford University and the author of the critically acclaimed Why the West Rules for Now, another book that certainly would be worth discussing here at FPRI. He has published many scholarly books and has directed excavations in both Greece and Italy. He lives in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, which is where he joins us today. Welcome to People, Politics, and Prose, Professor Ian Morris. Well, thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction and for inviting me along today. You bet. No, this is this is a very exciting chance to talk about this. So I, you got to start at the beginning. If you're going to talk about a book with 10,000 year history, how did this book come to be and how does it fit with your 
your work up to now? Well, yeah, I guess there were sort of two things behind it. Um, one was yeah, a fairly intellectual kind of reason, and the other was more of a, a gut reaction kind of thing. And so the, the intellectual reason was, you know, I started my career working in ancient Greek history and archaeology and digging stuff up in the Mediterranean, like you mentioned. And uh, I found that right from the beginning when I was a grad student that yeah, I'm trying to answer particular questions about Athens in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, but if I enlarge the framework a little bit, look at a bigger piece of Greece, longer period of history, different answers start to appear to me. If I make it bigger still, looking at the Mediterranean, I get different answers again. And this went on for quite a long time, several years, and then you're bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually I get to the point, I'm look, trying to look at the whole world across the entire period since the end of the Ice Age, around 12,000 years ago, and it dawns on me that what I'm really interested in is actually the questions about the big picture, rather than using those to inform nuances on the little picture. And so at that point, I decided, okay, I'm going to move into this big picture stuff full time. And I wrote the book, Why the West Rules for Now, that you mentioned. And um, <clears throat> I had a great time. I've been writing books like this for over 10 years. And I had a great time doing it. But all the time, in the back of my mind, it's like this voice of my sort of I'm unable to suppress the voice of the historian in the back of my mind, constantly saying, well, yes, okay, this is all fine and good, but actual history is made by real people living in real time, doing real stuff, not on a 10,000 year global scale. And you know, all of this theorizing, it's not much use to anybody, unless you can bring it back to the turn the telescope around, bring it back down to earth to resolve, to, to give us new ways of looking at something that actually happens. So I'm thinking for a while, I should write a book where I try to do that. And then I wake up on the morning of June 24th, 2016, and the British have just voted to leave the European Union. And I say, aha, <laughs> they have provided <laughs> really perfect test case here. Does the 10,000 year perspective help you understand what just happened in a new way? And of course, I come to the answer, yes, otherwise we wouldn't have a book to talk about. So I decided it does. And so that was sort of intellectually what pushed me down this path. But then the other thing was, um, you know, I, I grew up in Britain, as you can probably tell from the way I talk, and uh, have you know, subsequently moved across the ocean, settled in California, got all kinds of advanced degrees, and, and at least before the pandemic, was always hopping on airplanes to go places. You know, I'm the sort of person who is going to be just appalled by Brexit. And uh, I mean, obviously, it was going to be cl a close vote, and I'd written a number of op-eds for British newspapers in the run-up to the vote. And it seemed like every time I wrote one, the, the margins narrowed further. <laughs> so I thought I should stop doing this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it took me very much by surprise. And, and I mean, like a lot of people, I felt it as a, sort of a personal insult that they decided to do this. And of course, once I got working on the book, I discovered there was just a whole lot more to it than I'd realized. And the issues on both sides are um, a lot deeper and more interesting. But yeah, it's really these two things came together. Right. Well, I like that combination of the uh, the longer historical development, sort of your career in general, and then this one particular catalyzing event. I wonder how many books would not have been written if the vote had been fifty one to forty nine in the other direction. Yes. Uh, yeah. But you know, I guess one of the one of the interesting things about the study of history is that uh, it takes. Uh, uh, breaks and calamitous events, if you will, to come up with some of the best writing. Um, I, 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 a, a general question has occurred to me. We were talking before we started, right? I'm a, I'm a modern historian, so I come at things from one direction. You started as studying the ancient world. Do you think that ancient historians have more courage when it comes to talking about broad sweeps of time than modern historians do? <laughs> That's a good, a good question. However I answer this, I'm going to offend somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm providing you cover, right? I am. Yeah, I, I, that, my question suggests that modern historians have less courage, but you go. You can go ahead and agree or disagree. Yeah, I guess my, I have a, a nice cop out answer though, which is it, it depends. Ah. Uh, it depends on when and where we're talking about. I think. Um, if you say go back to the 19th century, then I think ancient historians did tend to be very big, bold people, absolutely convinced. And if you've read Thucydides enough times, you have the answers to all of the problems. And, and these great ancient historians, because led the world into World War One and various other really brilliant moments. Um, so I think there was at one time this absolute conviction that the reason we study the ancient Greeks in particular, is that they founded Western civilization, set Europe off on this historical trajectory, different from and better than the rest of the world. So of course, studying ancient Greeks is gonna help you see everything better. And then it's like ancient historians kind of lost their mojo in the 20th century. And uh, I think part of that, um, 
was a, a very intellectual thing. Again, the, uh, yeah, new fields, like especially anthropology, come up with this more evolutionary view of how modern society developed. And increasingly, if you go around, you're know, banging the drum saying, hey, you know, Pericles created the West and all those people who don't have Pericles' legacy are inferior to us. That is just starting to look just, just stupid as the century goes on. And I think as a result of that, um, ancient historians kind of funneled backward into more and more intensive study of a fixed body of texts. And so um, in some I say at one point ancient historians did tend to be very bold. I think we're, we're, we're getting our mojo back again now. And uh, several of us in the ancient history field have been writing big history books on the assumption that um, you, know, you can't understand long term trends unless you're starting some way back in the past. You've got to look at big slices of time, which gives us a relative advantage over some of the modernists. I think the modernists, again, you know, sometimes modernists can be way more bold um, than ancient historians. And of course, the sort of people you're likely to have on FBRI events will tend to be modernists. And, uh, and again, modernists also can be very, very particularistic. Um, but but uh, also sweeping too. So it can sure. be a cop out. That that's all right. And, and, and <clears throat> that's a perfectly legitimate answer, right? The, it, it is a joke. I, you know, while I don't speak on behalf of the War College, we, we joke our students all the time that the the ob, the uh, uh, answer you can always give to any question is it depends. <laughs> um, so if you're, you're ready. At least you were ready with that. Well, because this gets to this, you know, when you because then when you do decide to write something as big as this, right, a hundred centuries of life on the on these. Uh, these rocks in the ocean. I, I, I want to tell you that I was actually having a conversation with my 15 year old son and his friends at his school leaving ceremony last week. And they were debating about going down a local creek and that there was a, uh, a, a rock in the middle of the creek where they had stopped while they were tubing down. And it turned out that it was private property. And, uh, and they were told to get off of that property. And my son says, you know, who cares about a little rock in the middle of the water? And I said, son, that is, that is all of world history in a nutshell there. Lots of people care about lots of little rocks in the middle of the water someplace. Um, but <laughs> be that as it may, sorry, um, uh, be that as it may, uh, you have to figure out how to, how to shape such a narrative. And you shape your narrative around these three maps. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could give our readers a sense of what those three maps are and what they represent, and we can talk about them in detail. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> the, the, the basic thrust of the book is this idea that geography is destiny, um, as, as the title says. So geography is destiny, but it's up to us to decide what we do about that destiny. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it's going to be a geographical argument, obviously. And I, I think that any geographical argument that you can't tell in maps, there's something wrong here. Something's gone seriously wrong with your thinking. And so... Um, and right from the get-go when I start writing the books, I'm thinking this has to be something that can be expressed visually uh, in terms of maps. And um, I happen to stumble across uh, one of the maps, the Hereford map that I begin with. And then that kind of just led me uh, to thinking down a particular channel that led to the others. But so, so the basic idea is, yeah, okay, 10,000 years of British history, heck of a lot happened in those 10,000 years. And I think probably the, the density of historians to civilians is probably higher in the British Isles than anywhere else on the planet. It's so much you can know about this stuff so it is slightly overwhelming but um taking the long-term perspective on this um and i should say i start ten thousand years ago because that's the point when uh, rising waters as the glaciers melt at the end of the ice age rising waters begin converting what had been a sort of broad british plain sticking out into the north atlantic connected to what's now france begin converting that into a group of islands uh, so that's why i start where i do um but i realized that uh, for almost the whole of that story, up till 500 years ago, even though there's so much going on in the British Isles, um, the basic story, it's kind of the same from 9,500 to 10,000 years. And the basic story is Britain is not at the centre of anybody's stage. Britain is at the margins of a European stage. Um, the English Channel is more of a highway than a barrier in the sense that anybody, um, you know, missionaries or merchants or microbes, it doesn't matter. Anything that can get to the European European side of the English Channel can get to the English side as well, because there's no such thing as the command of the seas in the sense that a modern strategist would talk about that. You can't close an enemy fleet in blockades in its harbours. You can't drive its trade from the sea. You just can't do that. Um, and so anything that gets to the continental side can get to the English side. And the reason for that is uh, what I think drives what geography means, technology and organization. There are no ships that can stay at the sea for long periods, closing off ports. And even if there were, there's no organizations, no governments, no merchants can pay for these things. So 
Channel is a highway, not a barrier. The Atlantic Ocean is a barrier, not a highway, because to all intents and purposes, it's kind of uncrossable. So the British Isles are these little blobs just off the coast of Europe. And the first map I use, the Hereford map, that really sums this up. This was painted by a guy named Richard of Haldingham and Lafford. Uh, we know almost nothing about the guy. Painted around the year 1300. It now hangs at Hereford Cathedral, which is where it gets its name from. And it's a very disconcerting map to the modern eye, because like East is at the top for the very good reason that the East is where Jesus is going to come from at the second coming. So of course East is at the top. The center of the map is Jerusalem, <laughs> for obvious reasons. It's the center of the Christian world. And then everything else is kind of crammed in in a very strange looking way to the modern eye around Jerusalem them, with the British Isles stuck off at the very edge of the map, these little group of blobs, and the English Channel is painted as being narrower than the River Nile because um, England, he understands British Isles are so close to Europe. And British history is basically about what, uh, English history is about what comes its way from the continent, then Welsh, Scottish and Irish history are about what come their way from England. And that's the basic story. For nine and a half thousand years, British history and the internal history of the islands is about dealing with these geographical facts. Um, but the, the, the story that drives the book along is geography drives history, but history drives what geography means. And so as societies develop new technologies, new organizations, the geography stays more or less the same, but its meanings really change. And so like the big sort of pivot point in the book comes about 500 years ago, when you start getting ships like galleons that really can stay at sea for months at a time. You could, in theory, blockade a Spanish fleet in its port. You could cut England and the whole of the Isles off from the continent. You could turn the sea into the, what Shakespeare calls this moat defensive. And the, the Shakespeare example is not just because it's a great line. Shakespeare writes this in the 1590s, which is exactly the point when this for the first time becomes possible. Mm -hmm. So you could do all this if you had a government powerful enough to reach into people's pockets, steal their money and spend it on building all these ships. Of course, a government that's strong enough to can do that is strong enough to do a whole lot of other stuff as well. So you get these intense debates in England. Do we want that? And you have the civil wars, you cut the head off a king, you withdraw from the, the Catholic Church, all this bloody violent stuff goes on. And in the end, though, they decide, yeah, actually, we do want that. Yeah, we're going to have that. And so they, they build their moat defensive, they build their powerful Leviathan government, they unite, for the first time, unite the whole of the British Isles into a single kingdom ruled from London, and they create an um, intercontinental empire of trade on which the sun never sets. An extraordinary period of strategic reorientation, changing the face of the map. But the tragedy of British history, basically, is um, the forces that drove, oh, actually, the map. I have a map drawn by Halford Mackinder, the famous geographer, published in 1902, showing Britain at the centre of the world. It's a great map, mm -hmm. and everything is arrayed around the British Isles. Britain dominates the Atlantic Ocean, and through that, the rest of the planet. That, that map goes away, and this, I think, is in many ways the tragedy of British history, goes away for the same reason that it came about. Technology and organisation keep changing, the world keeps shrinking, and um, increasingly Britain is getting pushed off the North Atlantic, off the globe, off the oceans of the globe, by rising piles of money in other parts of the world, made possible in large part because of the um, sort of networks of free trade the British helped create. And so you've got one big pile heaping up in North America, another one heaping up in Europe, with Germany at the centre of it, um, seeing off the challenge from the Germans. Um, dominates the early 20th century for Britain. But the only way to see the challenge off is by putting Britain under the wing of the North American pile of money. So again, geography has changed its meanings completely. And I, uh, the last couple chapters of the book are about the third map that I use, which is called the money map. Um, which is a great map. Uh, it shows you, and you know, normally a map shows you the, uh, the, the countries get a share on the map proportionate to the number of square miles of the Earth's surface they cover. We're all used to looking at that. This one shows you the world divided up proportionate to the GDP of each country. So North America just inflated like this giant balloon on the map. And um, Europe, especially Western Europe, again, a giant balloon. And then East Asia, the third mountain of money on the map, that is inflated like a giant balloon. And uh, you know, very significantly, countries like Russia, are just this little string running across the top because its GDP is so tiny. Um, <clears throat> so this, on this money map, this is what geography now means for, for everyone in the world. And what this means for Britain 
is that it has to figure out how does it negotiate its way between the three great mountains of money and particularly the East Asian mountain of money. And uh, I conclude sort of by saying that I think historians of the future, when they look back on the Brexit decision, they the question they'll be asking is how well did that decision do to position the British Isles on a world dominated by these three mountains of money, but above all by the rising Chinese mountain of money? That's mm. the question they'll ask. And as I was writing the book, it becomes more and more clear to me that this is actually a question you can ask of every country in the West. The, the details change from one place to another, of course. So American geography is not the same as British geography, but its meaning is rather similar. And the question, mm. I think, with any of the big foreign policy decisions the US is making in the 2010s, this is going to be the same question. Did this help or did this hinder in the relationship with China? Right. Well, and, and that's what got me thinking when you talk about the different kinds of maps and the, the way that the, the meaning that geography acquires, right, is when uh, a certain type of English, well, I'll say English in particular, more than British, because the, the Welsh and the Scots and the Irish have other thoughts here, but for the English in particular, the, um, the, the belief that the Mackinder map, the idea of Britain at the center, and Britain distinct from the European continent, um, that that if people view that as not only the, view that as natural and desirable, then so much of the politics of the last 50 years necessarily had to revolve only around that question is our, our, you know, our relationship to Europe. And that unfortunately that, that, that fixation, that sort of backward looking fixation on a map that indeed may have become obsolete. Um, is what shapes politics. I don't mean, you know, we're, we're not going to debate Brexit here. I'm with you on that. But I've, but I've been thinking about this, right, is that um, uh, I, I came across, uh, even in the 1960s, a German politician, Franz Josef Strauss, in a television interview when arguing for European integration. He was specifically talking about the French, but this could work for the British too. He said that no single European state, no matter how glorious its history, no matter how, how great its wealth, could possibly compete on the continental level of the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Um, that's and he what he said was that's that's geopolitical arithmetic. And this was an argument for European integration. And yet it is interesting right, that 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 kind of argument perhaps came easier to a German, especially a German in the 1960s, when Germany can't think of itself as the center, can't think of itself as a power in, in itself. And so it's an interesting thing that history can can enrich a nation's outlook, but can also sort of put blinkers on it or can pull it in one direction. Um, and I, I, I thought about that when reading this book, that uh, you know, when there was a time when the king in England also thought of himself as a king in France um, and, 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 and thought nothing of traveling back and forth to reclaim his throne. And yet the, the emergence of the channel as a vital division, a channel that's perhaps even wider than the Atlantic um, is a particular um, you know, modern English construction. And mm -hmm. I guess to, I, I'm, I'm curious, right, how do, we, how do we make sense of that? Are there, I know your book is about Britain, but are there examples of other countries that have, that have essentially made this decision that uh, there is a particular geographical um, uh, piece that is, is, that is essential to their identity? I, I, think of the, I think of the relationship between Greeks and Turks across the Aegean as a potential other example, but I'm curious what you have to say about that. Yeah, I, I would bet that probably if you, you thought about it hard, most countries would have something like this, some mm -hmm. geographic thing that sort of focuses their attention. I mean, I think I say with the, the Russians, um, you know, see the openness of their country to the West, that geographically, that you know, there's sort of no barriers between the Urals and the Atlantic Ocean, frankly. <laughs> and right, and right. Uh, you know, for the last 400 years, Russian rulers have, in a sense, quite rightly, been obsessed with pushing their frontier as far to the West as possible to get some strategic depth. You know, you think every hundred years or so, somebody's come from Europe and burned Moscow. This has been their basic storyline. Let us not forget that. That. And I think that does continue to shape a lot of the thinking. But actually, the US is another, mm -hmm. I think, very good example because you've got these you've got these two gigantic oceans so until relatively recently these were genuine moats defensive I and mean, the, the british could project power across the atlantic in the 19th century but it's a real stretch to do so you know, burn burn the white house in 1814 but within 20 years of that this is kind of ridiculous to think the British are ever going to be able to do that again yeah, these are definite moats defensive and of course it's such a wrench for um, the US public and US policymakers 
in the 20th century to start saying to themselves, well, actually, these are not really moats defensive anymore. If Germany wins World War I, that is a real problem for us. If Germany wins World War II, that is much more of a problem for us. Um, you, we have to start putting American forces on the ground in Europe, being actively involved in European politics. Um, places like South Vietnam, the probably you know, half the population couldn't find on a map before the 1960s. These become existential concerns for American governments because the geography has changed its meanings. Um, you know, things like NAFTA, uh, is NAFTA forced on the US, something like it forced on the US by the meanings of geography, or is it not? And these are you know, profound geographically driven questions that um, Ameri the American people have to wrestle with. And the, I think the pace of change is just going to intensify. It's going to get right. faster and faster. The, and I think about that as the, the interplay between the uh, geography as it exists and the way that ideas or social developments change. And I think specifically in, in English history is would the channel have been such a distinctive barrier if not for the Reformation? Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then also the question of would the English Reformation have happened at all without the channel? Um, I, 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 I don't have an answer for this, but I've, I've, I've been meaning to ask you from the moment I read your chapter on the, the first, when the Engle exit, right? When, the, when, when, when England decides to leave the first European Union, with, which is the Catholic Church. I mean, yes. you know, what is yeah, the relationship between geography and ideas? And that's well, it, it, exactly. it would have been much more convenient for me writing this book if the English had postponed leaving the Catholic Church until after their civil war. Um, <laughs> because it would have fit better with the story you're telling. Right? Yeah. Because the problem with history is it is not actually written by somebody like me. It, it just happens. And so <laughs> you can't rely on people to do things in the order you'd like. But um, I think but this, this is actually a very good example of the way that you know, the, the vast impersonal force of geography collides with the intentions and wishes of the very important people like Henry VIII, mm -hmm. um, that uh, they often operate completely independently of each other, but then they get tangled up together um, anyway. Like uh, sort of logically for me, it would make most sense if the English had said, oh, we have this way to separate ourselves from the continent militarily with the big fleets, let's do that. And then they said, oh, having done that, let's now separate ourselves intellectually and in identity as well by leaving the Catholic church. It actually happened the other way around. Um, and having left the Catholic church um, and then discovering at the end of the 16th century under Queen Elizabeth, that they have the, the past ability to sort of physically militarily leave the European sphere up to a point anyway as well and the two stories then flow back into each other and um, England being Protestant not Catholic starts to become a huge part of the relationship with the continent but, but yeah you're right I call in the book I call um, the Reformation the departure from the Catholic Church in the 1530s I call it the Inglexit which is a, an extremely ugly word but I did that because it's the one point in the entire British story where you can say there really is a at least a vague analogy between what happened in the 1530s and what happened in the 2010s. Right. The, um, there's also kind of a vague analogy, you don't want to push it too far, but I think it is there, between the modern European Union and the medieval European Catholic Church, uh, that they're both empires of soft power. The most Occasionally the Pope does have an army, but not normally, he's not supposed to. You know? It's an empire where, like you know, classic soft power in the modern world, the church exerts its power by making other people want to want what the church wants. And you know, why would you not want what the church wants? The church wants to save your eternal soul from the fires of damnation. I mean, who is going to oppose that? You should want to want what the church wants. Um, but of course, the church is then able to use that to <laughs> get all kinds of other stuff from everybody else too, it becomes the most powerful organization, but certainly in the Western world, the richest, mm -hmm. most sophisticated organization. And this, I think, is the basic, the classic soft power problem that the church has, that the more it succeeds in using its soft power to pursue its mission, the less the Pope looks like this penniless carpenter who wandered around doing good deeds for people. I mean, the innocent the third, he ain't no penniless carpenter. I mean, he's, he's the not. most powerful man on earth. I mean, it's like if to get elected president of the US, you had to prove you were the most humble person on the planet. This is going to be a challenge. So the church has always got these challenges and the English sort of separate themselves from the church um, in a way that has certain things in common with what happens in 2016. Right? Mm -hmm. Henry VIII didn't want it to happen any more than David Cameron wanted to take Britain out of the modern EU. They both through the combination of short-sightedness and personal greed and ambition and just 
ridiculous accidents. They're both kind of stumble, oh, and wicked advisors, of course, there's always wicked advisors. Both of them stumble out of these organizations. And then they really do say, oh, oh crap, what do we do now? And um, you know, people in Britain complain endlessly about the, the four years of wrangling that ensued after the referendum before the formal departure. Well, the, the English, with the Catholic Church, the English had 150 years of wrangling and they burned each other at the stake over this. And they fought a civil war largely over this issue. So Brexit has actually gone amazing amazingly smoothly. This is what we learn, I think, in the 16th century. See, that's a, that's an excellent perspective to offer on this, right? Or at least I, I certainly hope we're not going to, you know, if, if we're going to have another prime minister who decides to go back in and we go back yeah. out like Mary, we could, exactly. and we'll have recusants and uh, goodness knows, it could be very interesting indeed. Well, this is, you know, this, this entire question about, you know, there's, there are, there are divisions, then what do you do about them? Well, I have a question here from the, from Jerry Rubenstein out in the audience who says, Bringing, bring us back to the present a little bit, that Britain voluntarily shrank its empire in many ways after World War II. They did it largely peacefully. Um, and Jerry asks, did they have a choice? Uh, uh, so this is a question of, you know, how do we, how do we appreciate the decision to, for Britain to shrink? But also, what might the world look like if they had not peacefully, you know, essentially acquiesced, if you will, to the, to the outside pressures that they faced? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, the, the British Empire. I mean, it is sort of remarkable how. I mean, could, there, there is a lot of violence, and the historian at Harvard, Catherine uh, Caroline Elkins, has written some very good books about True. it. There is a lot of violence, and people uh, people sometimes are rather shocked by this. It's like they forget that the British Empire was an empire, and this is what empires do. They they kill people to make them do what they want. So there was a lot of violence, but relative, of course, to what happens to the French Empire and plenty of other empires, this goes remarkably smoothly. And one of the things that, I mean, I guess I sort of vaguely knew when I was starting writing the book, but really came home writing the book, was just how cynical the British leadership always was about the empire. Because mm. I, when I was a little kid, I was born in 1960, and so um, Atlas's published in that year still had a very large portion of the world coloured red as the British Empire. And we were um, raised, at least in my family, raised thinking that on the whole, this was a jolly good thing that we'd had this and enlightened all these people around the world. Um, and uh, there is, I think, you know, in many people in Britain, so a certain nostalgia about the British Empire. But the leadership was brutally cynical about this. And the empire was good for certain interests within Britain, especially the financial interests. But also the empire was kind of essential to making it possible for Britain to become the world's first industrialized economy. Because you couldn't do that unless you've got people to sell all this stuff you're making, or buy all this stuff. And the empire, very convenient for that, very convenient for shipping cheap food to Britain in return. So empire, really good thing for that world system. But the minute it starts looking like the empire isn't doing the right job anymore, people say, okay, well, we're done with that. They're a lot of people are ready to walk away. Uh, and you always think even of a guy like Winston Churchill, you know, we think of him as a rabid um, mad dog imperialist about India, which he kind of was. Um, but in Ireland, Churchill says, well, in 1922, he says, well, we could make Ireland stay within the United Kingdom, but it would uh, require acts of extreme violence, and they're not worth it. Walk away from mm -hmm. Ireland. And um, this, I think, you see going on. It accelerates after 1945, of course. It becomes, the empire becomes very problematic after 45 because the, the, the shape of the map has changed. The big issue now globally is, um, by the late 40s, is American containment of the Soviet Union. And so it's, you know, like I was saying about how historians will judge Brexit in the future, every policy Britain pursues, the prime minister has got to ask himself, how does this fit in with American containment? And the empire is an embarrassment. And there are some bits of it where the nationalist forces are sufficiently left wing that um, Britain can sell it to the US as, hey, we're fighting communists here. And if you can do that, it can kind of be made to work. Otherwise, oh boy, you, know, you just don't want to go down that road. And of course, Britain discovers this painfully in 1956 at Suez. Don't want to go down that road. But uh, Jerry's counterfactual, just a quick word, word on that. You know, what sure. would the world look like if the British had dug in their heels and all the retired brigadiers and everything and had their way and, and the Union Jack was kept at the top of the flagpole? I think it would look pretty much like it does now. Because uh, this is, just, I mean, you just start thinking about it for a minute. How can we, what world do you, are you living in where you think that could possibly still be going in the 2020s? Um, it is just unthinkable. And the outcome, I suspect the outcome would have been dramatically worse for the British if they dug their heels in and tried to hang on to the empire in the Middle East, the empire in Africa. Um, that it, a lot of 
particularly think people on the right, a lot of people will condemn British leaders in the 50s and 60s for sort of kowtowing too much to America, um, to running for American help anytime there's any kind of big problem. But it's like, you know, what do you think is going to happen if they don't do that? So I suspect it's going to, for, from the British perspective, the world would now look very similar, but worse. Well, and, and I wonder about th this, precisely this question was that, that it's in part because of, from the English perspective, even though you note there was, there was violence in the, the, the sh uh, shrinking of the British Empire, but because from the British perspective, it happened so smoothly, mm. that that allows for a degree of, of uh, a degree of imperial nostalgia that having had to fight and lose every square inch of the empire, there would be a little less nostalgia about it, or there would be more, there would be more pain associated with the memory. But instead, the memory is uh, kept a little hazy, kept a little positive, which, which then gets to the, one of the great paradoxes that you raise in the book. <clears throat> and that is that um, you mentioned how you know, Britain May, you know, move, makes this move towards becoming a global imperial power. It both um, accelerates and profits from industrialization and the first waves of globalization, really, by becoming this great free trade force. And yet, those forces of the economy, uh, you know, as as another writer once said, right, you know, all that is solid melts in the air, and all that is holy is profaned. Um, yeah. That um, that <clears throat> free trade will eventually undermine all of those big five things that you mentioned, right? Sovereignty and identity and security. And yet it was, it was free trade that made Britain great, but it's also free trade that undermines that particular type of greatness. And how should we, how should we make sense of that thinking of it now and how have the British made sense uh, of that development? Yes, well, because the <clears throat> fascinating thing about you know, making the points you're just making about the British experience is it's so hard to look at those details from early 21st century America and not think, oh boy, <laughs> where Britain went then, where that's where we let's, go now. Let's just say, let's just say that thought has not been far from my mind as I'm no, preparing for no, this program. No, because I think it, it is sort of hard baked into the, the project of globalization and the creation of free international markets and free movement of people, free movement of currency, you know, all, all the freedoms that we enjoy in the world now. Um, they, uh, you know, Countries like Britain and the US pursue these freedoms because they see a benefit in it for themselves. But um, generally, actually one of the nice things about writing this book was that I generally came out with a rather higher estimate of statesmen in the past than I had going into it. On the whole, they do tend to be very aware of what they're getting into. And this is like, I mean, Clausewitz <coughs> has this great line about military strategy. He says, every strategy has a culminating point beyond which it starts to become the reverse of what you intended. And so British pursue the free trade agenda. And up till certainly the 1850s, it's going great guns. There's very little for most people in Britain to complain about with the free trade agenda. And then rapidly the horizon darkens and things become terrible. Um, <clears throat> or at least are perceived as becoming terrible because the the open markets, they basically create the conditions within which skillful actors like the Germans, like the Americans, can create tariffs around certain parts of their own economies, allowing them to, to build these up indigenously, while profiting from um, all the goods and services and information moving around in the British system, and get to the point where they can challenge the British. And of course, the analogy with China, very, very hard um, to miss that. And, um, and I think, yeah, the it, it's always going to be an argument over, well, okay, so the country is doing well out of, out of openness and freedoms globally, but how far should we let that go? And you actually, I mean, you see that in Brexit, with Nigel Farage very explicitly makes this argument. And you see that earlier in Britain as well, I mean, the, the one time there really was a big pushback against the freedom of the world kind of agenda, the strategy for the British, was that the, toward the end of the 19th century, when it's becoming clear that the American mountain of money is beginning to overtop the British, and this is a bit scary for a lot of people, and people start talking about, well, are there other ways we could do this? And this idea bubbles up, um, becomes very popular for a while, imperial preference. That they look at the US and say, well, the Americans, you know, basically, well, basically the British, colonize the East Coast of North America, and then expand out and turn the whole of this subcontinental zone into a single political and economic unit. 
why don't we do that again? But do it, do it right this time. You're not annoy them the way we annoyed the Americans in the 1770s, so they go away. But be nice and get <clears throat> Australia and New Zealand, <clears throat> Canada into a kind of British confederation, English language confederation. There's this great map I use in this book, uh, by my book, by a guy named James Bielik at Oxford, which shows you the British Isles with Canada and, and New Zealand and Australia towed across the oceans and anchored just off the coast of the British Isles. And he says basically, wow, doesn't this look like the US? Which is his whole point. And this ferocious debate gets going in the 1890s, just after 1900, over imperial preference. And in the end, um, what was by then the traditional liberal, um, in the European sense, liberal view of the world as a free trade zone, that view prevails. But um, it, wa it was a really compelling argument for a while for some people. We must break away from free trade because having made us great, free trade will now destroy us. And, and I will say that's that's something that that one also sees going on today as well. The um, the ongoing discussion about what does it mean to leave the European Union because you know it is a it's a it's a trade community, but it, it imposes restrictions. So Britain should become global buccaneering Britain. Um, but then there also was enthusiasm for the idea of Kanzuk, right? I, 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 yes. that, that somehow there that once again this idea that Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK would find their way back to each other. Um, so it's interesting, right? So ideas don't go away, I guess, once they once they start, right? Yes, yeah, because the great difference between the Kanzuk idea and the imperial preference what is that everybody outside of a handful of people in England think that Kanzuk is ridiculous. <laughs> And this is a great line from former president of Australia. And he's asked about Kanzuk and he just says, utter bollocks. And that's all you need to say about this. You know, nobody in Australia wants to be part of an imperial federation with Britain anymore. This is kind of a ridiculous idea. But I mean, having said that, that, that particular idea is ridiculous. It, it's not completely ridiculous for mm -hmm. the is to say that Britain can become something like Singapore on Thames, you know, <clears throat> low government low tariff free trade center whether they can actually do that is another matter entirely but uh, yeah i think it's tempting sometimes to say oh all the brexiteers these are just a bunch of nostalgic romanticists who think that if we just get the europeans out of our business the world will revert to the way it looked on the kinder's map in the 19th century um a lot of them i think are much more serious about this and do have alternative strategies but again the big question is well, can these things be made to work well, and that gets to the question that you cover in, in, in the latter chapters of the book, right? When you talk about this idea that the real question at the beginning of the 21st century should be Beijing, not Brussels. And so the idea of how do we deal with the Chinese, mm -hmm. that, that this then Britain is confronted with the question that essentially, I guess the Europeans are confronted with and the Americans as well, is you have the reality of Chinese economic power. And so should the goal be to make an accommodation with that power, to seek partnership with that power, or to bandwagon against that power? Um, and that gets to the idea of what is the organizing principle here? Because it's the organizing principle, a common history, uh, common identity, um, or, or is it simply uh, uh, material interest? You know, leaving it on, on a purely sort of unemotional level, right? It could be any one of those things, but one simply would have to decide which, which will guide your policy choices. And how do you see that developing as we go forward? Yeah, yeah, I, I do think this is the big question and not just for Britain. Um, of course, many, many countries around the world are <coughs> facing a similar set of debates. And I actually think Australia is the most interesting case because mm. this, I say this is maybe the first place this really became an issue. Um, over a decade ago, they were already worrying. So, so saying, you know, okay, the United States is our primary strategic partner. We have all these ties of tradition, um, culture with the English language world, our identity, uh, so important to us. And yet China is rapid, has already become our primary economic partner. Right. How do we avoid having to make a choice between the two? This should be the goal of Australian strategy. We retain enough freedom of movement that we're never forced into a position where we actually have to make that choice. And so I think this is on a, a rolling basis around the rest of the world. Everybody is having to come to terms with, with this mm -hmm. question, find their own solution to this and you know the, the idea the idea of the british or, or the americans or canadians for that matter buddying up to china making china their primary global partner i mean this just feels sort of ridiculous in the 2020s but the thing is stranger things have already happened and if we went back say 150 years to the 1870s in britain um your primary enemies are France and Russia. France because they're French. <laughs> they're just the enemy. 
centuries and centuries and centuries. Not Thank you, William of Normandy. <laughs> So, so France, just because they're French. Um, Russia, because it's on the global stage, Russia is the primary rival in the great game in Central Asia, right across a huge stage. These are the enemies, and Russia is this wicked autocracy. We can never possibly be friends with people like that. Germany, the German states, these are your traditional allies, because you want to deal with the French, what do you do? Well, you, you encircle them, you get behind them, you make alliances with Frederick the Great, or basically whoever else is going in Prussia against the French. Um, it begins to become clear by the late 19th century, this is not working anymore. Germany is becoming much too big to fit into that role. It doesn't want to be our, our, our sidekick anymore. Uh, we're going to have to deal with Germany more directly. And abruptly, really, over the course of like 10, 15 years, France and Russia go from being the ancient enemies to being the primary allies for whom we will go to war at the drop of a hat. The United States goes from being a sort of uh, well, initially, of course, the 19th century, an enemy, then being a sort of potential rival who's kept at arm's distance, so rather like China today, to being our, really our number one ally. And it becomes clear 1916 is the crucial year. Um, Keynes writes a memo to the British cabinet saying it has become clear that unless something changes by the end of this summer, the president of the American Republic will be able to dictate terms to his majesty's government. Britain cannot keep the war going without American money. And Woodrow Wilson plays, I mean, we always think of Woodrow Wilson as an idealist. He plays that financial game so cynically and manipulatively. And um, had the Germans not been so incompetent, um, he would have stayed out of the war and Britain would have been forced to come to terms on, on Wilson's terms. So the, the strategic map just shifted so dramatically over the course of about 20 years that, um, the thought that Britain and other European countries might flip over to a Chinese alliance, we should not rule this out. Um, the, the great barrier to that, I think, is, as you say, is identity. That This is such a hard sell. And you look at the Confucius Institutes that the Chinese government set up in um, Western countries around the world, it seems to be a disaster. And they, they make China look worse, not better. It's a very hard sell, I think, to persuade people that China is an attractive destination for them to want to get to. Um, but it doesn't mean that it, it can't be sold. And I think one of the depressing lessons of long-term history is how often soft power follows hard power. Mm -hmm. The Romans create, create an empire, everybody fights bitterly against it. Then what do they do? They want to become Roman. Um, so, you know, this is, I think history kind of gives the answers to where this can go. I think it just mm -hmm. allows us to frame the questions in a more useful way. Right. Well, and, and, and of course, it's a, it's a reminder that the enormous soft power of the United States means that the United States is, is not likely to go away anytime soon, even, even, even at my most pessimistic, I have to remind myself of that. But <clears throat> I would say Jerry Rubenstein follows up with the, the uh, legitimate question is, um, it may be if the, if the British are deciding whether or not to uh, join up with the Chinese, why should China care about the UK? Uh, and so this, this gets into an interesting question, a bigger one of geography is destiny, yeah. is, you know, um, of course, the United Kingdom thinks of itself as very important, has been very important as a world power, but is essentially, right, a series of small rocky islands uh, with bad weather uh, and charming people. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and so the, the question of, you know, because uh, this goes to Chris Weston's question as well, is, you know, will it, if geography is destiny, does that mean that Britain really can't stay away from the European Union forever? either, right? Is, is the future, you know, Singapore is Singapore because Singapore is a city state and, and you know, can be what it is. But a middle-sized power like Great Britain, um, how much real freedom of action do they have in the contemporary world as opposed to in a previous fragmented world? Yeah, that, that's, a, of course, the thing that I think one of the costs of the Brexit debate was taking people's attention away from the fact that Britain's fate is being made at least as much in Washington DC and Beijing as it is in London or Brussels. And I think it did take people's attention away from that. And I mean, but the, the first part of the question, about, yeah, well, so what do the Chinese want? So why would they even care about these? I think it's 6,390 islands. Or 10. It's a lot of islands. Only 150 have got people living on them. Why would they even care about that? And um, I think... Uh, if Chinese behavior so far has been, is any reliable guide, then we, we can see sort of vaguely what they might be driving for. That um, a, a world where Britain buddies up to China or is sort of you know, crushed under the, the Chinese boot, uh, however you want to see it, um, it will be very different from a world where 
Britain was crushed under Hitler's boot or Stalin's boot or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the Chinese, there's, there's no, there's not going to be any fleet steaming up the, the River Thames, bombarding the Houses of Parliament. This is just a ridiculous idea. The Chinese are not going to do that. Um, but what they are going to do, uh, I think um, there's going to be a lot more Chinese accountants showing. There's going to be a lot more entanglement with Chinese business. There's going to be a lot more kowtowing to Chinese interests. I mean, you know, like all the Hollywood companies dropping all the negative references to China from movies. That is going to be kind of the way things go. Government will start to be less democratic. Um, the world, I think, may not dramatically change, but slowly and quietly it will shift drift in a Chinese cultural political direction and I say maybe a bit like um what happened in Europe in the nine, Eastern Europe in the 1930s when Hitler and Stalin are becoming such great powerful players not yet invading everybody but governments in Romania Bulgaria these are they start drifting in the authoritarian even more in the authoritarian direction and so I suspect that is the sort of thing that we're likely to see going on. And I think there is a, there is a, a model that might help us understand what this will look like. Because something like a world dominated by China, something like that has already been going on for the British. That at least since 1916, they've been living in a world where um, in foreign policy terms, they are dominated by the United States. I've just got to suck this up, learn to live with it. Then at least since 1973, when they enter the EU, one where they're also partially dominated by the Europeans. And the, w the way that looks, again, the Americans and um, post-73 Europeans are not invading Britain, but they are nibbling away at British sovereignty, identity, security, um, with the EU, laterally mobility, identity. All these things are changing. And um, people in Britain, people in every country in, in the world now, I'd say, are having to figure out for themselves what is the balance that they're most comfortable with, I think is going to be most productive for them. And in you know, 2016, the British decide we are not comfortable with the amount of control the Europeans have got, particularly over mobility in this country. That becomes the number one issue. But over all the other stuff as well, we just don't like it. We want to break away from this, take our chances on our own. We're, we're more okay with the amount of control the Americans have got over. And I think that question will increasingly rise to the top of the pile um, with the Chinese as the century goes on. Right. Um, well, we have a, a Nathan Boyes has a question as we as we um, come to our last 10 minutes or so. He says that McKinder described center pivot power and island maneuver power. The threat being the center power is able to control maneuver power. Mm -hmm. Is the freedom of maneuver key to our near future as it was in the past? Should we think of geography more in the space of technology? our markets um, or our, our politics. I, mean, this, the, I guess this is the idea is if we, if we move to the point where geography can be overcome in a lot of ways, but it still matters. Mm -hmm. How should we be thinking about the power of geography going forward? Yeah, yeah, great question, because um, you know, one of the ways you can write world history is by looking at how technology and organization have shaped the meaning of geography. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are some people who will say we've already reached the point where basically geography has ceased to have any meaning. Now, I, I think that's a bit ridiculous. I mean, I think you know, just ask anybody in Ukraine if they think geography. I would say geography. But ask ask anybody. Ask anybody trying to fly to Heathrow Airport today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if I were able had been able to do this in person you know, with you in Philadelphia, yeah, it would have been a sort of you know, grueling trip across country with who knows what kind of chaos along the way. But on the other hand, of course, it would not have been as grueling as if we'd been trying to do this 150 years ago <laughs> to get in a Calistoga wagon and schlep over the rock and be chased around by their native population, all kinds of bad things. So the geography has lost a lot of its meanings. All of its meanings have changed so much that uh, seen from the perspective of somebody in the 19th century, the world we live on now, we've got Zoom and all this other stuff. This would seem like a magical kingdom. I mean, we moved to Disneyland. We're living in Disneyland now. Um, but of course, the forces that have driven this change in the meaning of geography, they are, if anything, they're, excel well, they're definitely accelerating, not slowly. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the, the potential of that, where that might take the world geopolitically, it just needs to be a mind warping when you start thinking about that. But of course, one of the, the immediate sides of this is, yeah, is the geography changing its meaning so much? <clears throat> that uh, something like Britain's proximity to the continent really doesn't matter anymore. And um, I think right now, clearly it hasn't gone that far, but potentially this is the sort of direction and the, the things might be going in. 
And certainly the, the way Mackinder looked at the maps a hundred odd years ago, I mean, Mackinder was very, very conscious of the way history impacted geography. And of course, his, his famous stuff about the, the geographical pivot of history being Central Asia, the center of the Eurasian landmass. I mean, he was very aware that this was something that had already been changed dramatically by the coming of sea power and the ability of the outer rim powers, as you call places like Britain and the US and Japan, who have direct access to the world's great oceans, their ability to use that to dominate the inner rim powers, the, the great change of the previous 500 years. And because uh, now the question is, are we moving into a world um, where they say they, thanks to things like the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where um, the center of Eurasia is once again regaining what Mackenzie saw as its geographical primacy. And uh, the, the central, the powers that dominate Central Asia will be able to push, extend their power out into the outer rim progressively reducing the freedom for maneuver of countries like the United States till we come back to a, a world where China really can dominate it. And again, I don't think the history gives you an answer to that, but it does, I think, drive you to confronting these questions. Well, and we're, we're facing this, this ultimate paradox, right? Is because on the one hand, we do have the development of Belt and Road as a way to both, it's both about developing the power around the rims and about controlling the center. Um, we are in the middle of a war going on over the classic, the locus classicus, black earth of the center of, of the European continent in Ukraine. Um, so all of these things are happening right now, even as we use this technology of Zoom to talk to each other across 3,000 miles of, uh, of the continent. Um, and so, you know, one of the advantages of a book like yours is it gets people thinking about these big questions, even if it doesn't provide us the comfort of easy answers. Um, my last question for you today is, what are you going to do next? I mean, after you write a history of 10,000 years, right, Ian Morris, are you going to, are you going to go back to digging in a, uh, uh, in some, some uh, ar archaeological mounds in, uh, in the, in the Aegean just to, uh, to get your hands back in the earth? What happens next? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and actually, one thing that's, that's already happening is, I mean, I was telling you right at the beginning about how when I, uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book about Britain was this sort of nagging historian voice in the back of my head saying, well, yes, but it's actual, you know, people do stuff. You kind of got to show how this all works for the people. One of the, I guess I have a lot of voices in my head. This is not a good thing. One of the voices I have nagging in my head is the ancient historian voice, which says, well, yes, this is all fine and dandy. And you, you come on these Zooms and uh, people are very nice to you and you talk about all these things about modern history but you know what you really know about and what informs your views on modern history the only thing which uh, even potentially gives you something to say about the modern world is the fact that you're looking at it from the perspective of antiquity and prehistory this long perspective so what you really need to do is actually write something that is much more global, but um, specifically ancient, showing how there really is an ancient story to tell. So that's what I'm doing now, I'm writing this book about um, the, the ancient world, the global history of the ancient world, which is just an absolute blast, although it's extremely deflating, because I thought I knew all this stuff. And trying to plunge into all around the world, there's so much has changed in the last few years, particularly since the uh, the ancient DNA revolution of the last five years has revolutionized everything. And I, unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes left because I could happily bang on for a couple more hours about everything well, changed. Because now, because now we know, we can know so much more about what people in the past ate, where they lived, how they moved, um, how, how, how they were related to each other. Well, I'll tell you what, Ian, um, I promise you finish that book whenever that happens, 10 years from now, however long it takes you, right? Uh, we will have you back on to talk about that too. But, uh, but I have to say today, it's been a delight to have you on to talk about, about your book, Geography is Destiny, 10,000 uh, year history. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us today on People, Politics and Prose. Well, thanks so much for having me here. This is really great fun. Outstanding. And, and thanks to all of you for joining us on this program as well. It's great to have you here with us. FPRI would like to thank its sponsors and partners for their generous support in making programs like this possible. And we ask you that if you have enjoyed this conversation, that you tell a friend, bring a friend next time, that you consider becoming one of those members or partners who can help make these conversations possible. Today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose or other events at FPRI, please visit our website, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. I look forward to welcoming you all next month on People, Politics, and Prose. But until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>